Oh, no, no, no. After the fact. Oh, no. They How do you watch it live? Uh, about 20. Oh. And 20 locations could be 40. Uh... Okay. Okay. So, so good. Meet all. Meet all. Yeah, it's something new. I'm going to have to get this taken care of. Okay. Close. Oh, look who's here. Uh, okay. I think we're all set. Oh, I think it wants me down here. Okay. Is this okay? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, you're on. Hey, look, still kicking. Huh? Hey, shit, they're still kicking. <laughs> Not swinging. <laughs> swinging. <laughs> Good. That's all you got left. Huh? How are you feeling? I'm feeling fine. I'm good. Thank you. So all of the force in our trouble, 
the world. First of all, what is there that this partnership that's born in Christmas and Patrick Francis? Or any part of the summer? And secondly, what does he mean? Why do I need to put our attention to it? So this question is discussed in the portion. There are no uh, throwaway comments in Rashi. Rashi said it and is teaching us something. So we'll get back to it, uh, I hope, before the end of this year uh, to see why perhaps this version is uh, so special and chosen. In the Medrash Rabbit on Kuma, Rashi quotes from the Medrash, famous uh, incident by Kora. The Medrash says that, uh, that the women here play an important role as usual in the story. So, for instance, owned and tell us. Uh, was saved because his wife said to him, Don't be a fool. What difference does it make whether it's Dora or Moshe? You're, you're the same, uh, you know, you're the same taxi driver in the end. So what are you doing? Why she get mixed in? And she prevented him from going. I discussed this, this, uh, that letter with the Indian and the Cobra also had a red. This is Cobra. <clears throat> the letter says uh, that Cobra uh, came from the best letter and his wife asked him, What did Moshe say today? What was the subject matter? So that's the end of last week's parsha. The parsha of CC. Still favor. <clears throat> so he told her that the motion to play was her retirement requires fringes, CC. And uh, one of the uh, strings of the fringes has to be a <coughs> sailor of this blue wool. And this sailor uh, is the most spiritual of all of the strings. Hi. Not, where are you? Sailor is like the ocean, and the ocean is like the heavens, and the heavens like the East Africa. From South Africa. So okay, how was it? The blue string is our connection that binds us to yes, our creator. <clears throat> so she said, What if you have a rope that you grew up with? The entire rope is made of faith. You still need this little string. So he said, I don't know, but the ocean didn't explain that. And then uh, he discussed the Sousa with her. It's supposed to be a Sousa at one's house, south of those. <laughs> <clears throat> so that every Jew has, so to speak, uh, somewhere in the house. So she asked to buy a Moe story. What if he has a magnificent Torah library for the time when the books were books? <clears throat> they uh, left some. You still need a mezuzah. You can even say better. What, what if I have a sacred code in my house? 
dying in the zoo so I got the whole boat. So Kona said, uh, I don't know. When I asked him, <clears throat> so the next day in the Bits Medrash, the scenario that the Medrash was based on, he stood up and he asked Moshe. But now he asked him in a belligerent fashion. He didn't ask him that. He asked him in a sarcastic fashion. I got a garment that is completely exaggerated. You need to tell me I still need that blue string. I have a house full of books, full of cover. I still need that parchment on the door. So uh, the first thing we learned is there's uh, asking and asking. There's asking in order to obtain knowledge. There's asking in order to <coughs> make a point that the asker wants made. So, for instance, I have. Uh, Every question, the best of my knowledge, and I know everything. <laughs> Every question that the Bible critics have ever asked on Sukkim and the Torah has already been asked by the Porsche. The greatest biblical critics were Chazal. They asked from the basis of faith, from the basis, this is something that is true. How can I see the truth in it when I have some speaking problem? How can I interpret it correctly? Bible critics asked it from a different direction. <laughs> The direction was that uh, the Torah was, so to speak, uh, created by community and that uh, it's not holy. And then so they're asking, so it'll be the same question, but who is asking, why it's asked, and the way it's asked uh, determines the legitimacy of the question. So it's very possible that uh, this is Korah's question. Are legitimate. How is it? What fails? Very high risk fails or not? Legitimate question. But that wasn't the way it was asked. So uh, it was asked in a mocking fashion. It's asked in a mocking fashion. So then it becomes a uh, not a matter of knowledge or information, it becomes a matter of, of trying to destroy faith. So what's the question? So one idea is, and this is a basic uh, question that we have throughout Torah, are there reasons for the mitzvah. Uh, there are rational reasons. In other words, there are cooking, there are uh, mitzvahs that the Torah itself tells us that you're never going to figure out. I mean, it comes part the parts of Kuka. So that, uh, that you're never going to understand. Okay. What about the other mitzvahs in the Torah that are not cooking? How do we deal with that? Do we want to understand them or not? <laughs> or do we want to just say that, you know, these are the orders? Ours is not the question why, ours is supposed to do with God. 
Now there are strings in Jewish tradition regarding this. The Rambam, for instance, especially in the modern but they do Sadia as well in their movies today. And uh, the Mara and others are always of the tendency to try and attempt to give a rational explanation to this. And the Rambam goes to great lengths, one of the most controversial. Uh, opinions is as to how to deal with these things. So, for instance, uh, the, the laws of meat and milk, not to mix dairy foods and meat foods. So the fellow mentions it three times. So, Sebastian and Geneva are milk. You should not cook the goat in the milk of its mouth. From that five words, we have a whole section in here today. People have two refrigerators, they have two stones. We wait six hours. So So why did the Torah raise it as well as the national Yudiva Halevi know that the Torah should have raised it? Don't mix milk, meat, don't eat it together, wait, you know, say the whole thing. Who cooks <laughs> who cooks lamb chops in this moment? You know? And our civilization is this almost unknown. But the Rambam says the reason it's written that way is because that was the method of Abuzura, the pagan worship in the days in ancient times. And he said all of the mitzvahs come to wean us away from Abuzura. That's the purpose of the mitzvahs. The mitzvahs is to bring us to pure monarchy. That we shouldn't believe in all sorts of side things. So, for instance, the ancient world, he said, people felt that if you cook the goat and smothered milk and you ate from it, you know, then you wouldn't get corona. Now, since we don't know how people get corona, and we really don't have any of the world matter. So naturally, we're looking for nothing that I would tell you is outlandish because we don't know. Wear masks, don't wear masks. Meet with people, don't meet with people. Take a shot, don't take a shot. Take four shots, maybe a fifth one. We don't know. And therefore, uh, you know, back as long as he said that the, the best way to prevent it is to wear a scarf in the summer, so people would wear scarves in the summer. So here, the Avodah was to cook the meat in the mother's milk. And so that's why the Torah phrased it that way, and he shouldn't. Shouldn't go to the gimmicks. Everything is to prevent you from a mother All of it. And therefore, the mitzvah of tzitzit is also to leave some of those hard to the COVID or such. Tzitzit is there to remind you of all mitzvahs. Mitzvahs are there to remind you of the fact that. You're a creature of the Creator, and that is your eternity. And that's what a person is supposed to, so to speak, have in mind. Now, the problem with giving rational reasons for mitzvahs is 
is because many times what's a rational reason in one generation uh, no longer is relevant in another generation. Again, what's the actual deep but how they below is not very relevant in our time. We don't see a whole zero that has it on floor. So therefore, why are we here? You know? And the early, the early before we used to say that the, uh, uh, the loss of cautious was because uh, if the food was unhealthy, you could get the uh, parasites, trichinosis, whatever. But now that we have uh, government control on food, so there's a no problem anymore. So the reason went away. The reason went away is that the law go away. And therefore, the other stream is that we do it because God told us to do it, and that's why we do it. And I don't know why we do it. I may try to give a rational reason to make me feel better about it, but that would be uh, arrogant to the extreme to think that that is the reason. We never know the reason for this. We may ascribe reason. It may satisfy us temporarily, but the long range of civilization, uh, the rational ideas uh, sometimes uh, lose all sense of uh, truth and explanation. So therefore, uh, that's not advanced reasons for it. So you have these two streams that exist until today. And it's able to be able to keep it high for both ways. There are people that need reasons that people that don't want to. The famous uh, anecdote that uh, Rabbi Chaim Samovechik uh, had a question regarding the rabbinic decision that he had to make in al -Ohra. So he wrote to the Yitzhak from the inspector, who was the uh, Roman covenant and who was the leading posseg at the time, and he presented the question to him. And he wrote to him in presenting the question, just please give me the answer, permissible or not permissible. If you try and explain it, no matter how you explain it, I will destroy the explanation. <laughs> so those are the schemes that are involved here. So that is the fact. She and the Korach are asking Moshe, do you need a string? What's the, we know that you tell me what the purpose of the string is. I know what the purpose. They have a relationship with God. And I have a relationship with God with my whole garment. I need a string. You know, the mitzvah is only a means to an end. I have the end anyway. So why should I even bother with the means? And the same thing, I have uh, my, my house is full of books. I have a secret door in my house. I have everything I need to do. And, uh, not necessary for me. No. So, no shit. And to cover up, no, you know, you have to do the next one. Even if you think that uh, you know, you're going to do very well without the mitzvah, that doesn't say you can do the mitzvah. And we see throughout the long run of Jewish history that all of those that gave rational explanations really fell short. And uh, many times the, uh, the uh, explanation. Uh, 
that no longer seem valid, and then the whole thing fell apart. We find that regardless of that, I once had a discussion with the Yankee Commons. So we were talking about the second day of Yom the, the, the exile, not the exile, the exile. So the, the uh, modern verse show that explains to us why we have the second day of exile. Because the messengers couldn't get there in time, and they wouldn't know exactly, they knew that it had to be one of the two days, but they didn't know which one. But everyone after the boat. Now in our time, we have a permanent calendar, and we know exactly what day of it comes. So why do we keep the second day? This one said, meaning I would say to be a day. The tradition of our forefathers remains with us. And uh, oh, for the last uh, over the uh, over the centuries, there have been many groups in Israel that wanted to be Jewish people that wanted to get rid of the second day. So in our time, the form and conservatives they don't have a second day. But uh, as has been noted by the greater people than I am. That uh, those that don't have the second day eventually don't have the first day. <laughs> Somehow that can happen. So, this question of how is Kula Taylor's that would raise the motion is the challenge to the midst of it, so then that needs to be tried. Second idea in Talachakua Kairos. Why do you need to scream? Because the Torah does not ask perfection. The Torah does not ask us to wear a Talachakua Kairos. It's 100%. The Torah asks us to observe the mitzvahs. Do what we can. Many times people overreach. They can overreach and I as well. It says, our boy Mishnasu Lapardes, the four great people that went to dealt in heavenly matters. Three out of the four came to a terrible end. One lost his faith. One became insane, one never had a family. Great people, however rich. <laughs> so the Torah warns us about that. The Torah says they do one thing of a house that's fully fun. And you won't go every basis to shop. Maybe you won't have the ability to learn that on a regular basis. Maybe you don't have the capability. <clears throat> I'm telling you what to do to do it, but on you know, one screen, put a misuse out of your door. And many times the uh, stress of perfection leads to uh, disaster. But you want perfection from our leaders, the no perfect people. So you be any, you're asking to be disappointed. You want perfection in the family, you're asking to be disappointed. You want perfection in the stock market, you're going to be a poor man. The allowance for the imperfection. That's one of the greatness of the poet. I mean, you see that I, uh, one of the great criticisms of Christianity is a 
that it begins to affect. So therefore, it becomes almost irrelevant. People don't turn the other cheek. People go, oh, I don't think it's going on. Too much. Too much ends up being too little as well. But that's another lesson here. From the balance of two little things. Just one uh, point about Kalis that I uh, have bad for you. I've spoken about it many times, but I think it's very important. Uh, for the last uh, 150, 170 years, has been that for whatever reason, Kalis disappeared from the Jewish world. From about the fifth century onwards, but we no longer have chaos. Now, how do you have chaos with blue string? The only way you have it is by dyeing the white wool to the color to the blue color. And where do you get the dye? How do you manufacture the dye? So, already in the time of the Talmud, there were fraudsters, fakers, that made fake dye because payments was expensive and everybody wanted it. There was a market. Then the Gemara tells us that there's a creature in the sea called the Chilazon. This creature has a pouch and it's neck, so to speak. And that pouch is full of liquid. What? You puncture that pouch, you take out that liquid, that liquid can be made into the dye that turns the wool into hair. We lost the tradition as to what was that creature. Without that creature, you can never have chaos. So, uh, if you get but one of the interesting things that you can look and just speak a little, one of the interesting things is that in the 19th century, there was an awakening within the Jewish people that somehow. We were going to uh, come to a better era. It would take terrible things, but we're going to go back to the land of Israel. We're going to restore Torah. We're going to do it. We're going to get out of the exile. Which is why uh, we're sitting here in Jerusalem now. One of the awakenings was let's have Kaylin again. And uh, so it was the great Rabbi read it. Hello, Kenneth. And he, he was a genius. And actually, he was a kind of a genius, he was a controversial people. So he was my genius. To make it so dark. The For instance, uh, the Seder of the Aras, which is uh, the sixth section of the Mishnah, there's almost no Gemara there. Except in the second Gita, there's almost no But scattered throughout the rest of the Talmud are explanations of. Mishnayas and Baharas. So what the Rebbe did, the Rebbe, the Rebbe, is that he collected it all and made a Gemara. Not he made a Gemara, he made a Rashi on one side and the faces on the other side. 
called the Tigray Baharis, a work of tremendous genius. But it came to be controversial because people would say that the world was real, but it was put it together. So the second time he printed it, if he printed it at the top of the page, this is not a Gemara, the heavy page. But it didn't help the controversy in that. So another controversial thing that he did is he spent 11 years of his life looking for this creature, this was own, because he wanted to have a tail. And uh, he uh, came up uh, with the conclusion that the creature was a small squid, a small octopus that was found off the coast of Italy in the Mediterranean. And uh, he developed tailor from the blood of that creature. And till today, the Rajiva Shasidi used that tailor to beat blue. Uh, in the, the early 1900s, uh, Rabbi Herzog, who later would be the chief rabbi in Israel, uh, wrote his doctoral thesis in Cambridge University of the Tchela. And originally he wanted to prove that the Rashida Rabbi was correct. However, as he got into it more and more, he realized that it was not there. Not only that, he realized that the uh, laboratory that was making the trailer uh, die was fooling the river because they used prussic acid in the dye, and prussic acid would turn everything. So when I heard so I then took a guess, <laughs> he said he thought that it was a snail called the Murex Functionist, which is just off the coast of Lebanon and Northern Israel. And it has a shell. You crack open the shell to get the snail, and the snail has a pouch, and you take its blood out. Uh, he didn't, didn't do anything practical about it, he just guessed at it. Fast forward to the 1980s. The Israeli army in Lebanon, the Lebanon War. It goes all the way up to Beirut. On the way there, the Israeli army comes upon a cave. In the cave are like a million shells. Of a creature. Cracks for shells, cracked over. They call in all the archaeologists and everybody in the Ramadan, and they all agree that this must have been a Taylor's factory. And that these shells are from the creature that threw us on. Put the DNA, and it turned out that the Earth said, Look, right, the DNA is that you're a strong. So they captured uh, some Urex drunkular snails and they tried to make them die. The only thing is, the blood of the Urex drunkular is yellow, not blue. So they were stymied. But by uh, one of the great accidents that uh, happens, uh, the uh, Laboratory left the collection of the yellow blood out in the open, and after 10 15 minutes in the sunlight, it turned blue. And then we met all the requirements of the dye that were listed in the morning of the office. 
So that's the Tchewitz that is marked in the red. And that's the Psyl Tchewitz. They're all that I wanted to get into the uh, disagreement as to whether or not anyone should wear Tchewitz or not. But uh, the revival of the mitzvah, uh, again, uh, heralded, so to speak, the revival of the Jewish people as well. So that's the Psyl Chaimus that Korah said you don't need. Psyl Chaimus came out to be the symbol of the revival of the Jewish people. That's why he uh, Colors are blue and white, pale, colors of scissors. In order to symbolize the fact that the Korah was wrong, the motion is the Torah so that is. So, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Thank you for coming. Next time, we will be in the world. Thank <laughs> you.